Hi, welcome to Let's All Has Our Apsos. My name's Eamon, I'm usually the person that does the editing and all the video photography. I personally wanted to come on the video today to say a big thank you to everybody, everyone that's liked the page and everyone that's given us comments. The feedback's great and please, please continue to do so. Very quickly, the one thing that we would like you to do is to keep giving us names of people that you want us to interview. We can sit here all day and think of people and ask various people, but ideally we'd like your input as to who you'd like. That's the best way to do it. That way there we know we're getting the people that you want to be interviewed. You can do that nice and easily. I've put the details on the screen now for you. Just literally go onto Facebook and type in at, using the at symbol, Terry Pool Chatty Man. That will take you straight to our Facebook page and from there you can send us a message. Let us know what you think of the videos from there, that'd be great. And then the only thing I'd ask you to do is, on your screens now in the bottom right hand corner, you'll actually see the Captured Memories logo. If you could click on that Captured Memories logo, it will ask you to subscribe. By clicking on the link, it allows us to build our community, know that we're doing something right, and it also lets you know every time a video is coming out. So thanks for watching the videos again. I really hope you enjoy the next lot. We've got some cracking ones available that are going to be coming up for you very soon. For now, I'll hand you over to Terry. Thanks for watching. going to meet Mr. Peter Warby. Peter Warby is somebody I've known for a long time over the years and I've had the pleasure of staying with when I was judging in Australia. His knowledge for the breed is immense and it goes back years and years and years. As he's getting on in years today, his friend Stephen Farnham, also a top breeder in Absol in Australia, has volunteered to come and help and support him this morning. Thank you. I am looking forward to this. Can you hear me, Peter? Yeah. Good. When did, when did you first become involved with dogs? When did you first get involved with dogs? With dogs? Many, many, many years ago. What year? It was prior 1950. I had Dachshunds. I had one as a pet, a pedigree dog, right? Yes. After the Dachshunds, Bassets became fashionable and everybody had a Basset, so I had to have a Basset. Of course. Hey? Of course. Of oh, course. So I there were no stud dogs available to me to like. So I took a boat trip to Britain. There were three main kennels of bassets in Britain. I visited the first one and stayed a week. I visited the next two. And it was there that I met Paul Stanton. Paul Stanton was working as a kennel lad at one of the kennels. 
he mentioned to me that he had a friend coming over to Australia. And I thought, no more about it. But everybody was coming to Australia. Okay. I toured around. When I got home, a while later, the phone rang. This is Frankie Sefton. I thought, ah, Paul Stanton. So we decided to meet and we became firm friends. After a while, she presented me with a puppy. She brought in Cheska Jester and gave me Cheska, he's a hobo. Fitting. Yeah. Right, so where do you go from there? So did you show them? Did we? Yes, we were together. Um, Frankie was strange to the dog world or unfamiliar with our dog world. And I sort of went along to show her the ropes, more or less. But we became very firm friends. And we as success. Were you successful? Me? No. Frankie, yes. <laughs> she, she went a lot with Jester. Quite a lot. Yes, it, it was, became, became a very big winning dog, though. Frankie's Jester. Yes. Frankie. Frankie won a hell of a lot. Um, good. Um, constructed and well presented Lazars, they won a lot in the early days. And when I say the early days, when Lazars came in, sort of thing, they were there before, but not as well presented and not as well specimens. So yeah, Frankie won a hell of a lot with Jester. So where did you go to after that? What did you show after that? What did you show after your dog? What did I show? Yeah. I showed the Bassets until they died out. Um, and then with that, so Then I, I graduated into Lars, as you may as well say. Yes. I showed the young one and then as he grew older I showed more. Um then after a while, you know, not straight away, but after a while Frankie had been here, she decided we should import Another Lhasa. So, so where did you go? Where did you go to? Whose kennel? Eh? Where, what was the dog's name and whose kennel? Hard to believe, but the kennel was Beryl Harding's. Good to hear. Amazing. Eh? Amazing. And it was Brackenberry Tong. Yeah, I know the dog. I've seen the pictures. You've seen the pictures of Tom. You've seen pictures of Tom. Oh, yes. I've got fond memories of Tom. He started over 10, 12 champions. It was a great stunt dog. And of course, he had the substance and the style that was needed for this crappy lot here. Um, yeah. So, so, so it improved the quality out there. Breeding, Colin. Did he? Imp he improved the quality. Oh 
Oh, shit, yeah. Shit, yes. Did it? Oh, God, yes. That one. How would I put it? They were mongrels until he more or less came. He put substance, he put size, he put style, head quality, movement. Movement, definitely. That's something that you don't get, or we don't get. So where did you go to after that? Did you keep something yourself from him? Did you keep something from Tom? No, unfortunately. No. I didn't. I didn't have the room. So what else have you imported? What was your next import in Lars's? Oh, God. You would ask such awkward questions. <laughs> That's what I'm here for. <gasps> I'm making sure you keep away. Know about flowing imports. I got one from um, Sue Ellis. I got Nate one. Drake. Eh? Nate Nate Drake. Drake. Yeah. Yeah. One from Jim Bainbridge. Domino. Mm -hmm. Domino. Yes. Um, I think there was one or two others. But they weren't, they weren't notable as far as quality was improved. They were noted for appearance and style, you know, all that sort of crap. Yeah, presentation. Have you shown, have you judged around the world, Peter? I have judged in England. I have judged in Denmark. I have judged in Holland. I have judged in America, and I have judged in Scandinavia and New Zealand. Great. Of all the places that you've judged, what's been the best dog you've ever judged? In all the places you've judged, what's the best dog? Oh, couldn't tell you. Never tracked a cup of it. I finished up with little brother and sister in Holland. Um, the thing that I found lacking in most places was size and movement. Too big and too, too big, yeah. and too cheeky. Yeah. Quality of presentation was excellent. I think sometimes I think sometimes we put presentation above soundness and substance. Oh yes, yeah, I agree. I agree. Which is unfortunate. What's the what's the state of the breed in Australia at the moment? Is it good? Uh, who was it? Who was the dog? America? What? Who was the dog from America? All Lane's Intrepid. Oh, uh, Intrepid. Intrepid. I think he's set in the rot with height and movement. Presentation, perfect. Couldn't fault it. But his size and his action and it went right through his stud dog, uh, right through his stud bitch. What's the quality like here in Australia at the moment? Shocking. Absolutely shocking. In what, in what way? All right. We have three keen exhibitors in Sydney. Three. Right? Yes. We have 70 or 80. We have three. Shocking. Which is, which is nothing, really. Hey, there's nothing. What he's talking about is, as he said, when you judge the specialty here, 
you would have had over 40 dogs. Yeah. We're now getting 12 dogs at a specialty. Yeah. So the numbers have dropped down considerably. Shocking. What's the quality like? The quality of our dogs. Be nice to Hank. He lives with you. Um, yes, be nice. Size is coming down. We have one keen exhibitor that shows with the correct action. That's the three of them. No. No. And so I think a bit like what's happened in England, we've lost breeders because of age and health. So there aren't as many breeders around anymore either. Why is that, Stephen? Do you feel that people aren't getting involved with dog shows as much or over here, we're losing exhibitors, but a lot of it to do with the expense. It's expensive now over here to enter a show. It's expensive petrol traveling to shows. Do you find the same things over there? Um, the expense, not so much because relative to you our entry fees are tw like twelve dollars so six pounds oh well our entry fees are more like 30 pounds yeah so i think the thing is at times it comes across as a closed shop if i was a new exhibitor and wanted to show lars's a breed is not going to sell me the pick of the litter so we're doing nothing to encourage new exhibitors, particularly with a coated breed. But even with a smooth coat breed, if I decided I wanted to show a Whippet, which is still a numerically strong breed here, no breeder is going to sell me the pick of the litter. So but, we stop ourselves a little bit there too. But that's different to England. Yeah. I would to England looking for a Laza after Tom. I fell in love with Sue Ellis's stock, loved them. I fell in love with Jim's stock, I got them both. But yes. what I say there is. Can I just stop us for a minute there, Stephen? Yep. Can you just move into the picture so pe people can see who you are? What are we doing? Okay, move across. Because <laughs> you're not shy, are you? That's beautiful. Uh, so I'm presuming then, Stephen, that you've got your dog there with you. Yes. So you got... st and you still show, don't you? Yes, I do. Do you take Peter with you? Yes. Oh, that's excellent. That's excellent. Yeah. It's just, well, unlike when you were here, where I'd be out showing every weekend, my relationship broke up. I now show when I want to. Yes. And if, if I'm entering a show, Peter, I, he gets the option, does he want to come or not? And the night before he goes, what time are you getting up? I go, I haven't decided yet. He goes, well, I need to know. So yeah, Peter's keen to come to the show. But again, he's a bit disappointed and I'm disappointed. Like, at a regular show in Sydney now, we get three Lars's. Nothing, is it? Nothing. No. And, you know, one of the main reasons why I keep showing every now and again is people rubbish my dog. So you go out and beat them and go, yeah, well, I'm happy. Then you go back. Is this the grey one that you're showing? No, no. The grey boy in the photo that I think you've seen is Bamboo. Absolutely. Is that bamboo? Yeah. Bamboo. He, yeah, he, he was, he was uh, up on size, but he's now twelve or eleven. So time goes by, doesn't it? Yeah, I'm showing the gold boy Hank, which I'll send you a photo of him. He's just in all the dogs that I've shown over my time. Hank is the most relaxed dog in the ring. If he thinks the judge isn't looking at him, he 
he's just going to lay down. So is he, is he Australian bred? Yes, he is. He's out of, I have a golden one. He's virtually the last dog race back to Jim's breeding on both sides. That's Jim Grundy, Nehemia your camels. And luckily, there's another person here. His name's a couple, Phil Brown and Peter King. Yeah, yeah. They're using, they've just got a, two litters on the ground side by bamboo. One of them is, I think they're now 18 months old and another one about six months old. So I've tied in with them and we're breeding together because I don't want to breed. I just want to have the occasional lies that I can take out and annoy people. But, yeah, it, and that's what I meant about the breeders dropping off. Jim decided, even when we were together, he was talking about if he reached 60, he wouldn't breed anymore because if a Lars is going to live till 15, the last thing he wants when he's 70 is 20 goals. I know. I know what you're saying exactly. I've, I've got to that stage now. I've just had a litter, but I've not kept anything because I'm 72 now. Yeah. And you just, excuse, this is where you're supposed to say, you don't look it. Yeah. Uh, and, and you think, don't you now, what's going to happen to them when anything happens to me? Yeah. So you just have to be sensible, don't you? Yeah, well, what I've been lucky with Phil and Peter is the litter that, the first litter they had at a bamboo, Phil and Pete went away. And a girl here that shows Guy Terriers had fallen in love with him as a baby. So we sent him out to her while Phil and Pete were away and she's fallen in love with the breed. And she was going to get something out of the current litter they have, but she's had a litter of skies and with everything decided no, but she took little Boo out to a show and an exhibitor there fell in love with him. So she's getting the pick out of my pick out of this current litter. So we've got a new exhibitor in Lars's and that's actually good, but getting a person that's never showed before to show, I think it's incredibly hard, particularly with a coated breed. Yeah, it's very hard, very hard. Yeah. You know, and, and the difficult thing for you, I would have imagined over there, is the distance you have to travel for shows. Oh, uh, yeah, but we don't worry about that. We've, we've always travelled those distances. I, mean, I know. I, I know. I can remember... And we came, when I came over and stayed with Peter, when I judged him, I was in Sydney, he said, would you like to go and meet some friends of mine who've got an Afghan kennels? I said, yeah, is it far? He said, no. It took us two days to get there. <laughs> <laughs> and, they, and he thought it was just round the corner. Yeah. It was, it was a wonderful experience. Well, let's just say I grew up in the suburbs of Sydney, but my father's family was in the Hunter Valley, which at that time was a three and a half hour drive. We went up there one weekend a month and did the rounds of all my father's relatives. So we're used to traveling distance. I think it's funny when you hear people in England going, oh, it's a four hour drive. We're going to have to have a stopover. Yeah. yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll have to stop over, have a cup I'm, of tea, take a picnic. Yeah, but I mean, I drive to Brisbane to show at Brisbane Royal and Melbourne. Brisbane's a 13 hour drive, and I do it one day. Amazing. Yeah. And yeah. Why, why I've got you talking about, I seem to have gone off to everything that we're yeah. going to say. What I'm interested about. How would you go on over there with using stud dogs if it's something that you want to use that's quite a distance away? You drive down to the stud dog. If it's a further distance, you fly the dog to the person or you can use chilled or frozen semen. Have you, used, have you tried that? Have you used frozen semen at all? Um, we haven't used frozen semen yet, 
but I know a good a lady in Perth had a her name's Kerry Mansell. Oh yeah, I know. I met I met Kerry when I was over there. Yeah, well, we had a dog that somebody else had brought into the country from America, and she wanted to use him as stud. So we sent chilled semen from Sydney to Perth for her to use, and she got a litter of four or five out of it. So yeah, you know, there are your options you have. But one it's, of the a, it's, it's a thing that we don't use in this country. We yeah. don't need we don't need to really, do we? Yeah. In the distance. I remember when I came and stayed with Pete for that time, and as I say, we went to visit the people with the Afghan kennels. They showed me they'd got a litter of puppies, and that was from frozen semen. And yeah. they they found it very successful. Yeah, and a lot of people are using it now. Yeah, you can bring in a canister of straws and maybe bring in straws from three or four dogs for the same price as the cost of importing the dog itself into this country. So if you're looking at a long-term breeding thing, you go overseas, look for your stud dogs and try to collect as much semen as you can. And you can use, you know, use that quite a lot and store it away and yeah, even on sell those drawers if you want to. But the problem we have now in Lars's is because there's so few breeders, we're looking, like Phil and I are looking at what stud dogs are around for us to use. Yeah, and we're a big country and we don't get over to Perth to see what Kerry's doing. We're relying on photos, you know. And then what, there's one breeder now in Victoria or two breeders. You know, you've got one breeder in Queensland and a few couple of breeders over in Perth. There's not that many around at all. Can I just ask you something else while I'm talking, Peter? How's the judging over there? What's the quality of judging? What's the quality of judging? Who knows? I was never there to judge no no oh here yes not good not good do you have a training program for judges no breed understanding you can say what's the most important thing and they'll say soundness it's not soundness is not important breed type everything is breed type no matter whether you look at Lazars or Bassets, anything, breed time. Do you know what I learned from you, Peter? You used to say on a regular basis, it's okay, but is it Tibetan? The thing that you taught Terry, do you follow me? How to drink. Yeah. Yes, to besides that, yeah. <laughs> oh, you're a star, Peter. An absolute star. So you've only got the one dog. No, no we've got four dogs here. Have you got five dogs there? Oh, I thought you just got the one. No, oh, the oldest will be 15 at Christmas, and he's still in code. Then we have an Hank? Ad, no kitten Whoopi. Whoopi. Whoopi is a black bitch. She's eleven going on twelve. Then we have Hank, who'll be I tell judges he's five. So it's a bit like in gay years he's five, but he's really nine or going on. <laughs> and then Pablo, who's Four going on five, and yeah, we're we're stuck. With, that's the number of dogs we can have. But then it's manageable. Well, it's what you want, isn't it? Do you think you'll have a puppy, another puppy? Yes, because Hank's getting you know getting towards the end of his show life. This is the old people's home. It's this geriatric. And I know. I do know. <laughs> I do know. 
I was saying somebody the other day that I was going to talk to Peter Warby and they said, oh, Peter Warby. I said, yes, he is 110. Oh, tell me, is Stuart Key still around? Stuart Keyes is around. He's, he's retired. He's very well. He's put on a bit of weight since he's retired, which I constantly take the piss out about him. But he's fine. He's really fine. I spoke to him the other week. Give him my regard. I certainly will. I certainly will. In fact, you've just done it yourself now, because he'll watch this. Okay. Well, I think that's about it. I wasn't going to do this interview now, but we just <laughs> seem to, we just seem to have done it. Okay. So this is Stephen Farnham. Yeah. People. So it's okay, Stephen, if I put you in this. Yeah, because I'm wearing this. But one of the rare times in front of a webcam, I'm wearing clothes, so why not? Well, why not? So you do realise that you will go worldwide. Even correctly. What was that? You would. You do realise this will go, will go worldwide. Oh, honey, I've been worldwide for years. I so should imagine. I should imagine so. <laughs> anyway, gentlemen, Peter, get back in. Peter, get back in. Is he fell asleep? No. Anyway, gentlemen, it's been fabulous talking to you both this morning. I hope you keep safe and well, and it has been a pleasure. Thank you. It's been a lot of fun. It's been a Good. pleasure. Oh, is he coming back again? No, we're actually what he's taped here. He's got. He's going to use. Oh. I think. I think that's good enough. I just thought I'd go with it because it was so good. Yeah. So is, is that a cut? Is that a? And you that? stay safe. Bye bye. Okay. Bye. Thank you. And thank bye. you, Stephen. Bye. Thank you, Peter. Bye.